But it would be so, I mean, any time though uh, now, if you want to get going it, again, like, yeah. Yeah. Good to see you. drive around yeah. town in Welcome it. Back. Okay. okay. Any time. Yeah. yeah. I'll check it. All right. So I think we are going to um, call this uh, regular part of our meeting back to order. We've already begun our meeting at six o'clock. We had an executive session and uh, we are now ready to jump right in. And um, I think uh, one of my favorite things I get to do, I've got Sue here. Um, Sue, I'm gonna come down. Oh. All right. <laughs> yes, all right, good, yeah, because we need to get a good photo of you. I'm gonna have you uh, raise your right hand and repeat after me. Um, I solemnly affirm that I support the Constitution and will obey the laws of the United States and the state of Ohio, that I will in all respects observe the provisions of the Charter and the ordinance, ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs and will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of... All right. Thank you. The rules. All right. Yeah. Welcome aboard. We appreciate it. Thank you. OK, um, so next up, uh, I think we have uh, announcements. And so I believe, first of all, we've got Marty Heidi here. All right. Thank you. Yes. I'm Marty Heidi, and I'm Green County Outreach for Congressman Mike Turner. And I'm here tonight. I'm kind of, I haven't been here for two years. And Richard's so my, my purpose <laughs> is to uh, come before you and kind of give you information that impacts you as council members and the residents of Yellow Springs. And that way, if someone comes to you and says, well, did you hear about this? You have information. And tonight, I want to talk about the new driver's license that are in effective uh, October 1st, 2020. And the new driver's license, there's two kinds. There's compliant, and then there's standard. And the compliant version, um, to get that, when you renew your license, you have to take a citizenship document like a birth certificate or a passport that's I'm promoting passports and um, your Social Security card and also residency your proof of residency whether that be a utility bill or something that's mailed to you um, to get the compliant this is together with TSA and Department of Homeland Security the compliant will enable you to board a plane through TSA and not just show your driver's license like you do right now, but this one is a, just an extra um, record of that, of that compliant driver's license. And there's about 39 states right now that are using this method, and Ohio just passed it about a year and a half ago. The standard driver's license is just your basic driver's license. They cost the same. So to get a standard driver's license, you don't have to have all the stuff with you to get it. It lists um, what's there, but the standard license does not meet travel security requirements. So you can still use it to check in at the airport when you fly down to Florida for spring break, but you also have to bring another document to accompany that driver's license, that standard driver's license that demonstrates your, your uh, citizenship, like a passport or a birth certificate. And my, my uh, recommendation is just get the compliant one and not, don't have to carry two documents. Um, the, it, again, it talks about the things that you need and the things that for both of them, and again, they're exactly the same. The other difference is you used to go into the driver's license, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, and they would give you a driver's license and you'd walk out, you'd get your picture taken, and you'd walk out and you'd have your license in your hand. Well, now they give you a letter, and that letter says that you've renewed your driver's license, and you wait for about two weeks or so until you get your driver's license in the mail. So it's mailed to you. It's not delivered to you by hand at the time that you renew. 
So this is just some information uh, by October of 2020, which <laughs> is right around the corner. Um, this is all, everybody will have one of these driver's licenses. And this is something that we don't <coughs> always check. We should every year on our birthday, but check the expiration on your driver's license and kind of get an idea of when you need to renew. Any questions? Yeah, so even if you don't need to renew, you should go in and mm -hmm. do that. Well, most to. of them, I believe, the way I'm understanding it, they gave kind of a four-year time frame when they enacted, the, when you know, Ohio in, adopted this, they gave about four years, so that would encompass just about everybody that had. My license expires in July of 2020, so I just will do it a little bit ahead of time instead of the October. I notice it says that uh, Ohio driver's licenses and identification cards issued prior to July 2nd, 2018 will not be accepted. So if it was issued before July 2nd, 2018, it, it you will should have, renew. Yeah, you should yeah. renew. Oh. <laughs> We're all up here checking. <laughs> yeah, okay. I know. Everybody yeah. check their life. Yeah. 2020. Right. Well, right. I, the right. other right. thing, right. from the federal side, I, I really think passports are a great thing. I know they're $110 to get a passport. They're good for 10 years. But a passport is a, a very, very good way to demonstrate your citizenship. It's a good proof of ID. You don't have to carry it. Like if you were to board a plane to go down to Florida, you would just take your compliant driver's license and be all set. But if you wanted to fly internationally or take a drive to Canada or Mexico, you, you, know, you would need a passport. So I, I think passports are a good way to go too. And Marty, is it my understanding that you can also help people uh, if they need to expedite their passports? Oh, absolutely. I heard that you uh, helped somebody recently. I did help that. someone yes. recently, <laughs> Ms. Wintrow. <laughs> uh, she got her passport in about four days. Great. So we were able to go through the congressional liaison with the National Passport Center. And my, my, my counsel is pay attention to what I tell you to do <laughs> and do exactly what I tell you. And they did it, got it, we're good. So, so um, any other questions? I actually, um, if you wouldn't mind passing along a, uh, a message to Representative Turner Certainly. from us, which is um, we'd really like him to think seriously about the um, gun control legislation okay. that is being talked about more okay. and more these days. Um, I think it's such an important thing for our nation and our state and our municipalities. And uh, you know, we want to make sure that mm -hmm. our children and, and everyone else is as safe as they can be. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it occurs to me that some of the basic things like universal background checks are not that big of a leap no, absolutely not. Well, they kind of do them for the exactly. driver's licenses <laughs> and passports. Thanks, so. Marty. Okay, thank All you. All right, thank you. Yep. Okay, the other, um, well, let's talk about any small announcements because I know we wanted to review our um, process with the uh, village manager um, hiring. Um, but uh, yes, Mayor Canine has a few Hi, things. Please come up, yes. Yeah. And I, I didn't mean smaller in a pejorative way, but rather oh. shorter. No, no, no. <laughs> no these, these are important announcements as well, but um, I know our village manager search announcement will take a little bit longer. Yes. There's a couple of things I want to address to you tonight. I have two proclamations that I'm issuing, and these are, I guess, what I call generic proclamations that were sent to me on a template, which I often get either nationally or statewide. But these two, I pulled and decided to go ahead and, and write a proclamation for them and apply them locally because I felt there were germane to some things going on in the village now. The first one is a proclamation on safe digging month. Johnny. It's going out to Johnny. And the reason why is because the village is in the process of changing out a lot of our infrastructure right now. Currently in front of my home on Fairfield Pike, we're doing the gas line uh, digging and watching all those hieroglyphics go in on the sidewalks with the blue lines, the, red, the green lines, the, the uh, gas lines, the water lines, the sewer lines. 
talking to the crews that are doing this work, it really became apparent to me how important it is for folks who are going to be digging to check, dial 811 to notify that you are putting in a new, digging for a foundation for a new shed or a fence that's going in, speaking of someone who had a sewer line punctured by an auger to, to put in a fence by the fencing company. Couldn't figure out why everything was backing up in the house till we found the concrete blocking the sewer line. So the fencing company hadn't dialed 811 to secure the information they needed before digging. So therefore, we are proclaiming April as safe digging month in the village of Yellow Springs, and this proclamation will be on display outside the chamber off at the council office at a, here in a day or two. The second one is to recognize the 200th anniversary of the Odd Fellows. We have an Odd Fellow sitting right here in our chamber tonight, in the form of Richard Zoff. It's the 200th anniversary of the Odd Fellows, and they really do so much for our village. Just to summarize for you out of our Sounds of the Springs directory, and a lot of folks might not know this, that the Odd Fellows, their lodge sponsors annual scholarships for Yellow Springs seniors, contributes to charitable organizations. They sponsor the Fourth of July parade, the fireworks at Gone Park, road cleanup, park maintenance, street fair participation, art stroll, and various fun activities. So we want to recognize the week of April 21st through 27th as Odd Fellow Week here in Yellow Springs. All right. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> but the issue that's dearest to my heart tonight, and, and another thing that I have to share with Council, comes directly from an event I attended today in Columbus. To give you background, in August of last year, as a member of the ACLU, I received their usual, some of the promotions they send out for the fundraising solicitations, always accompanied by an event or a, a activity or a policy or something the ACLU is doing. What I saw last, this was last August of 2018, was a cartoon that was talking about Ohio's mayor's court. Well, as you can imagine, I took notice, and there was a two-minute video in this cartoonish explanation of what a mayor's court was. And it was really rather buffoonish. It, it, it uh, was very derogatory toward mayor's courts. What I did was turn around and write an email to the ACLU of Ohio explaining my dissatisfaction with this presentation of mayor's courts. Within the week, I received a, an email back from their policy director, uh, one of their folks saying, do I mind if that information is passed on? And I said, absolutely not, please do. And I heard, a long story short, from their policy directors with whom I met twice, uh, along with Ellis Jacobs, too. Ellis was very uh, helpful in our conversations with the folks from the Ohio ACLU who were doing this report and policy examination of Ohio's mayor's courts. We met with them here twice, exchanged several emails, phone calls. Well, what resulted from this was a press conference today at 11 in Columbus, which I was invited to attend, and I did. What resulted today, what was handed out today, and this is the reason I'm giving you this now, uh, I was given one copy. I was able to abscond with five, <laughs> one for each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, oh, I wasn't able to get a report, two extra reports. They, they are going to send them to me when they do another press run. I copied off uh, their one pager for Judy and Patty. Thank you. And this summarizes their examination of Ohio's mayor's court. I want you to read this because I want you to be prepared for something that I learned when I first uh, ran for mayor and, and was elected and did my training and began learning more and more about mayor's courts. 
They're not held in high favor by the Ohio Supreme Court and many other legal bodies. My purpose tonight is not to talk about that. I just want to make you aware of this report on the mayor's court situation in Ohio. Following my uh, time that I spent in communications with the policy advisors and the legal uh, officers from the state ACLU, I'd like to address, here's my real purpose, address your attention to page, uh, let's see what page is Five. That? Page 22. Oh, five. Page 22. During our conversations with the ACLU folks, we were, we were able to share what we're doing in Yellow Springs in our mayor's court. And I want you to know that the Yellow Springs mayor's court is held up as an example of a mayor's court that is doing good work, making positive changes, doing what we can to help our citizens get local justice for local issues and not be a source of revenue generation for our village. So we got a really positive shout out in Columbus today. Uh, I was kept after for a couple of interviews with local papers in the Columbus area, which was pretty exciting. So I, I just want this to be in your hands and you can read the report learn, educate yourself on the, some of the uh, opinions behind mayor's courts in Ohio. A lot of them are valid, many of them are not. So mm -hmm. I leave it to you and that's all I have to report. Thank you, Mayor Kanai. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Well. Yeah, great work and you know, I think that also kudos go to our justice system task force. Yes. And to our <coughs> police department for yes. supporting Absolutely. this alternative model. Yes, and the police are being are working with the court on com coming up with some other alternatives to rather than just slapping a fine on someone. And I want to give a proper shout out to Ellis Jacobs too for his advice in interweaving what the Justice System Task Force was doing to improve our court. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, yeah, Lisa. I have a little announcement. Did you have an announcement? Oh, I just wanted to highlight the uh, Earth Week mm -hmm. activities that are going on April 22nd through 28th. Um, that the title of the whole theme is Weighed In About Water. Water is life, yet many communities have struggled with equitable access to and protection of water. And this is an environmental justice issue that is local and global. Weighed in and get involved. All of the activities are free. Of course, I'm particularly drawn to Monday, April 22nd at 7 p.m., the World House Choir. Um, it's at the Foundry Theater at Antioch College off Corey Street. And then on the 23rd at the Coretta Scott King Center in the morning, there's going to be an environmental justice teach-in. Um, that same Tuesday in the afternoon, an indigenous water protectors panel. That evening, a documentary film screening at Antioch, what lies upstream. And then Tuesday evening, April 23rd at 5 p.m. in the South Gym uh, community dinner. So there's gonna be a tree planting, Arbor Day celebration. Um, there's some volunteer opportunities. So if you're interested in learning more, um, you can see all the details at antiochcollege.edu backslash earth dash week. So participate in some if you can. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Mm -hmm. uh, couple oh, Wade In yes. is made possible thanks to support from the Yellow Springs Community Foundation. All right. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to mention a couple uh, events. Um, one of them is actually tomorrow. Um, the 9-11 uh, Memorial Stair Climb uh, folks are doing a fundraiser at Wandering Griffin. Um, if you have not participated in that event, all right, I would highly suggest you do it. Um, Karen, Nick Gaskins, and I all had like the gear on last year, and uh, it was really exciting. Um, also, if you haven't heard, we have a new business who's got a grand opening happening this Saturday, which is Green with an E Canteen. Uh, so our own Brittany Baum is uh, opening uh, an amazing shop, and uh, they're going to be celebrating that on Saturday. And uh, seeing Mark Heiss in the room, 
made me think about we've got another business coming into town. Um, he's been uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, t-shirt sales and other things under Yellow Springer Tees. But he's going to have um, a shop now, and it's also going to be the Buckeye Trail shop. Don't forget, we are mm -hmm. a Buckeye Trail town. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be on June 3rd, correct? We've decided that that's going to be the uh, grand opening. So <coughs> don't let anybody tell you that Yellow Springs is not open for business. We definitely are, and we continue to be business friendly. So um, any other announcements before we talk about the um, uh, village manager <coughs> hiring process? So I want to begin, and then maybe I'll turn it over to Marianne, um, by first of all highlighting that I heard from a lot of people, the vast majority of people, um, about how impressed they were with our process uh, this time around. I think when we hired Patty Bates, and we've had a great village manager for five years, um, we had a really good process. Um, but I think we made it even better with a lot, uh, a lot more opportunities for citizen involvement, for our village team members to give a lot of feedback. Um, council decided to be really involved this time around, and uh, we forwent the uh, consultant in this case to really be hands-on. So I want to uh, give a big thanks to our citizen committee, um, which facilitated a lot of that work um, that we paid for last time. Uh, a lot of volunteer hours went into it, um, and we had a very diverse group. Uh, I want to again give a shout out to Judy Kittner, our uh, council clerk, who um, really took the oversight of the entire process on, uh, was very professional, did a lot of amazing work there, wrangled uh, everybody, and, uh, and, and, and really made sure that it was a success. Um, the feedback that we've gotten is that uh, we brought four amazing candidates uh, to the village. Uh, they had a three-day marathon with a lot of interaction uh, and a lot of involvement. We are still in the decision-making process. And um, remember, as an elected body, we cannot make a decision unless it's in a public meeting. So um, on March, uh, I'm sorry, on May 6th, our next meeting, we will be discussing um, who we have selected and our reasons why. Um, but I will say the feedback has been really, really important. And uh, we learned a lot about those candidates they also really complemented the process. So Marianne, I don't know if you want to kind of talk a little bit in detail about some of the things we did over those three days. Oh, during the three days? Yes. Well, just to back up, I think that we had 62 yes. people mm -hmm. submit resumes. And that process went through a number of iterations. I think 10 people were taken off initially just because there was no relationship between their skills and background and what we were looking for. And then we used various processes that involved council members and staff members and citizens on our citizens committee to get down to, I think it was 52, then to 30, then to 18, and then to nine. Mm -hmm. By the time we got to nine, we had phone interviews, and in some cases, people actually came here and interviewed with a, a team. And from that nine, then we got to four. And so during the time that people came here, they were taken around to all of the village government facilities, like the electric substation and the water treatment plant, the sewer plant, the Sutton Farm, this building, and their parks. They met with business leaders and nonprofit leaders. They visited the elementary school. They were at Antioch. Um, they had breakfast with Patty, I mm -hmm. think. They had a speed dating lunch <laughs> <laughs> at Antioch. And then they had the evening forum on Wednesday evening to which a number of people came, a meet and greet after that. On Thursday morning, there was an informal 
meet and greet at the senior center. And after that, then we interviewed, we being council in executive session, interviewed all four of those candidates independently. <clears throat> so it was quite a whirlwind tour, mm -hmm. as you say. Yes, yes. Um, <coughs> oh, the one other thing. Yes. At the, uh, both the formal uh, forum on Wednesday night at the informal meet and greet at the senior center, at the luncheon, I think, and maybe some other places, people, citizens and staff, all had the opportunity to fill out a survey form, <laughs> rank the candidates for various uh, attributes, and all of those forms were collected, and Kevin and his team spent many, many hours <clears throat> analyzing the data and coming up with not only who the people, well, we met, we also met with uh, staff leaders independently, but to, especially for the citizens and the community members, what they thought. So we got all of that data and we used all of that data as we are, have been thinking about who we think will be the best candidate for the job. Great. Yeah. And uh, I, I wanted to mention, um, I saw Cindy Seek, who is a professor, uh, she's a resident and a professor at OSU who teaches research to medical students, and she commented that she thought that the survey form, the rubric, was, uh, was very good in the way that it balanced and helped solicit information, and we do want to thank all the community members that filled out those forms, as well as sent us letters and called us. Um, our, our heads are still swimming with all the information, and, uh, and, and we know that we can't make a bad choice. Um, and uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight, uh, again, is just uh, we appreciate all the hosts like Antioch College um, and the, our businesses and the schools who went out of their way to really help make sure that folks got a great exposure to, uh, to our community. because. Once we got down to that final four, it was definitely a back and forth. Um, they were interviewing us just like we were interviewing them. Um, so moving forward, our process will be that uh, we will, as I said, at our next meeting, talk about our reasons for uh, the selection. We have made a plan that there will be plenty of time for a transition, so Patty will be able to pass on all of her knowledge about um, the nuts and bolts of the village and help that person um, hit the ground running. Okay. So I, when we finish this topic, I'm sitting here thinking of things. My mind is catching up. I'm sorry. So yes. When you're done. I think we're, I think we're done with that. Okay. So I, I yes, Megan. I'm sorry. Maybe I wasn't quite hearing. Do have you not yet just made a decision? That's as, right. Yeah. Because, um, we, we did have an executive session where we, you know, uh, discussed, okay. you know, basically our reflections from the process. Um, and, uh, you know, we've taken in all the feedback that we got up and, well, we're still getting things actually. So, yeah, um, I guess that was my next question. Are you, do you, are you still, until May 6th, do you want more feedback? Sure. You, you have not made a decision yeah, or reached we, out to, right. plan to reach out to a candidate. Um, r right, there may be some, uh, I mean, there may be through our village solicitor some reaching out to um, the candidates just to make sure that this is really what they want to do and get an idea of are they, you know, willing to take this position. But we won't make a decision until uh, reach out to multiple candidates. I I, I think we could say our solicitor will be reaching out to to a candidate, to a candidate or perhaps more than one candidate. Um, depending on how things go. With the first candidate. So there is a candidate that you <coughs> decided to reach what, out to first? I, just what I said, our okay. solicitor will be reaching out to a candidate and okay. depending on how things would go. Would there be any chance that you would announce it before the May 6th meeting? I don't meeting? think so. I think Pending we, we talked about it. Yeah, unfortunately. Three weeks, I know, people are kind I, of. I, I know, unfortunately, <laughs> we tried to figure out if we could have a special meeting. Um, and maybe we will talk about that again before this meeting is over. But um, we do want to make sure that we're all here to uh, share our thoughts. And, um, and so probably not until May 6th. Because of travel schedules. Okay. 
Patty? Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to my staff um, and the way they handled um, the high winds and the emergencies and everything. I was out of town and Johnny was in charge. I'm sorry, JV. <laughs> um, but um, I was celebrating my anniversary and they were all stuck here um, dealing with everything from the residents and the citizens from the high winds and everything. So I just want to give a huge shout out to the staff and the professionalism that they once again showed. I mean, from the electric crews, the PD, everybody, Denise and Ruth Ann in the office, I'm sure Judy got some calls, everyone. I just want to give everybody all the kudos, the ladies in utilities and Colleen, I'm sure it was all hands on deck and I was sitting quietly in the Poconos. <laughs> so, um, way to go, guys, good job. Uh, and also, we will not have another meeting before Denise Swinger's birthday, so happy upcoming birthday. Thank you. All right. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny and team. Okay. Um, so, uh, review of the agenda. Anything that... Oh, no, I'm sorry. We want to do PNCs first. Consent, right? consent you want to do agenda. the consent agenda. Oh, do we have, yeah, we do have a consent agenda. Sorry. Um, so we've got uh, minutes from the March 18th and April 11th uh, executive session. Um, can I get a motion? I move that we accept the minutes. Second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And now review of the agenda. Uh, anything we want to add, change? I do actually want to add... Um, a resolution which designates the clerk as your designee to receive public records training. Um, it's a good ace in the hole to have in case you just don't get time to go do it. And I, there's a training up the road on next Monday. And so if we pass it, then you're all good for the next two years. I always encourage everyone to go get the training. But in the event that you don't, you are still in compliance then. Okay. So we'll add that to uh, legislation. Anything else? Um, do you want to move the Tecumseh Land Trust yeah. petition to an item? Yeah. Yes, I, I was going to suggest that we move it to old business. To old business or new business? Uh, excuse me, new business. Okay, so we'll do that. Anything else? Um, Did you? As part of my, I guess we could put it as part of board and commission reports, but I want to nominate a um, commission member for economic sustainability. Okay, great. And we also have... Uh, several nominations for the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals. Mm -hmm. So we will add those two. Would we want to move up any of our special reports? Maybe uh, for the up. police? Yes, that's what I was thinking. Well, um, we kind of have to do legislation yeah, first. Okay. It won't so, but it'll, it'll All right, be thank quick. you. We yeah. will legislate quickly. Okay. All right. Uh, petitions and communications, Marianne. Yes. So the one uh, additional communication we have is that the Repair Cafe, which is a time you can take something that's not working and get someone to fix it, will be happening on May 4th, which is a Saturday, from 1 to 4 at the Antioch Art Building, uh, 910 Corey Street. And this time they're adding something else where you can bring something to swap and it doesn't even have to be working. <laughs> they, they request you only bring two swap items though. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's move into uh, legislation and um, Denise, why don't, before we get into it, maybe just if you can let us know what we're, what all this is. Division regulations. Our public works director Johnny Burns and I were reviewing them um, <clears throat> because we're planning on having some uh, subdivisions that are upcoming. Um, he noticed that L anything to do with the electric utility was not in embedded in that code. So these are seven different sections where we've either added electric lines and transformers or um, things like having an underground. Uh, electric distribution plan, those kinds of things that are depending on what the piece of legislation is that is being added. Okay, thank you. 
So um, as, as anyone who would have looked at the legislation saw, we're, we're essentially just adding uh, a few words uh, that do make it clear that we need to <laughs> contemplate our electric system uh, in these decisions. Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, we've got the second reading of Ordinance 2019-07. Uh, Judy, could you read that in by title only, please? Yes, this is repealing Section 1226.01 definitions of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1226.01 definitions. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. Okay. Um, so I will open the public hearing. Any questions, comments, discussion? All right. If not, uh, Judy, could you call the roll? Yes. Sanford? Yes. Stokes? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Housh? Yes. And by the way, that also closed the public hearing. All right. Um, next, we have second reading ordinance 2019-08. Uh, Judy, title only again? Yes, this is repealing section 1226.03 contents of preliminary plats of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1226.03 contents of preliminary plats. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. Second. Okay. Um, I'm going to open the public hearing again. Any questions, comments, discussion? All right. If not, I'll close the public hearing. Judy, uh, roll call. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Sanford. Yes. Ouch. Yes. Okay, next up we have second reading of Ordinance 2019-09. Uh, Judy, again, title only. This is repealing Section 1226.04, submission of and action on final plats of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1226.04, submission of and action on final plats. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right, I'm going to open the public hearing. Any questions, comments, discussion? All right, if not, I'll close the public hearing. And Judy, the roll call. Krieger? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Sanford? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Housh? Yes. Next up, second reading of Ordinance 2019-10, uh, title only again. This is repealing Section 1226.06, Design Standards of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1226.06, Design mm -hmm. Standards. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. Second. All right, I'll open the public hearing. Any questions, comments, discussion? If not, I'll close the public hearing and do the roll call. Stokes? Yes. Sanford? Yes. Krieger? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. Next up, second reading of Ordinance 2019-11. Uh, title only, please. This is repealing Section 1226.08, Construction of Public Improvements of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1226.08, Construction of Public Improvements. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right. I'm going to open the public hearing. Any questions, comments, discussion? If not, I will close the public hearing. And Judy, if you could please do the roll call. Yes, McQueen? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Sanford? Yes. Housh? Yes. All right. Uh, next up, Ordinance 2019-12. This. Uh, title only, oh, please. Yes. All right. This is repealing Section 1226.09, Bond for Improvements and Maintenance of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1226.09, Bond for Improvements and Maintenance. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Um, second. All right. Um, I'm going to open the public hearing. Any questions, comments, discussion? All right, if not, I'm going to close the public hearing, and if we can do the roll call. Yes, Sanford. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Housh. Yes. All right, and I think the last in this set is Ordinance 2019-13. Uh, we can again do that by title only. This is repealing Section 1226.11, minor subdivisions of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1226.11, minor subdivisions. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right, I'm going to open the public hearing. Any discussion? Now I'm going to close the public hearing and uh, the roll call. Yes, Stokes. Yes. Sanford. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Housh. Yes. Uh, once again, I do want to thank Denise Swinger and our planning commission for continuing <coughs> to help uh, clean up our zoning code and uh, ordinances, and also for Johnny Burns noticing uh, that we needed to have that in there. Okay. 
Next up, we have uh, the first reading of Ordinance 2019-14. Uh, Judy, let's go ahead and do that by title only. Well, and Brian, this is actually the first and, and only reading because we are reading it as an emergency. Unless, Colleen, you can handle two readings. Do we need it? Do we need it right now? Yes, we're gonna we're gonna buy it. Okay. Okay. Just, just thank so you. We'll read be it. reading this as an emergency, and uh, if you could read it by title only. Indeed, this is 2019 first quarter supplemental appropriations and declaring an emergency. Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Okay. Can I get a motion? I move. I'm second. All right, uh, Colleen. So we are asking for fifteen thousand dollars to be included in the appropriations to buy TriCaster broadcast equipment for Channel Five. Channel Five. Community access. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, and we need that equipment because. Well, um, as most everyone knows, the the station has been down and not broadcasting continuously for how many months, Sean? So four to five. So, um, and we need to replace that piece of equipment. We cannot repair it anymore. Right now we are able to live stream and we, but other than that, all we have up on channel five is a thing that says, we're sorry, we're having technical difficulties. Um, M, the manager's technology advisory board has been meeting along with tech advisors to try to determine the correct piece of equipment. Sean has settled on a, a piece of equipment from Castus, um, which is uh, slightly less than the name brand <laughs> TriCaster, does the same thing but better, and uh, apparently um, has rave reviews from many of the people and municipalities current, currently using it. Okay, and we do have a budget for this, right? I mean, that appropriation comes It'll out of our It'll come out of the general fund, and it'll come out of the reserves, and it'll move into the appropriations. So but it we, allows us to spend it. Right, but we do get, we still get around 40000 a year from, uh, um, from we get, we get Spectrum. A, yes, we get around 40000 a year from Spectrum, but I think Sean has already used, or he has designated some of that, the things he wants to do with that, some new cameras, some other pieces of equipment. So I asked Colleen to find find it in the res reserves somewhere mm. so that we could still move forward. Okay. All right. Um, so since we are reading this as an emergency, um, I will open the public hearing. Any questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? Okay. Well, I will just say I, I think uh, it's very important. It's one of our village values that we make sure that we um, provide as much information about government decision making so that our uh, community members can participate. So I think this is uh, money well spent. And the reality is that 40,000 a year that we get, we ra rarely spend any of that on community access. So, um, okay. So thank you, Colleen. I'm gonna close the public hearing. And Judy, if you could call the roll. Yes. Sanford. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Stokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Housh. Yes. All right. Next up, we have Resolution 2019-15. Um, Judy, I think we can also do that by title only. Yes, this is approving an agreement between the Village of Yellow Springs and the Greene County, Ohio Engineer for a cooperative paving program. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right. Um, who's talking about this? I can. You want to? Um, the, um, this is the annual agreement where we piggyback on the uh, county contract so that we get a better uh, bid price on the paving that we're going to do this year. Um, Johnny has the streets. Uh, I asked him to be ready to name them, and I don't remember all the ones he told me, so I'm going to make him come up and do that. For the grinding and repaving, we are going to be on... Let's see, Corey Street from the Glen's entrance down to the Horse Park. <laughs> we'll finish Corey Street. Uh, West North College from Zinni Avenue to Phillips Street. That is some real bad shape right there. North Stafford from Dayton Street to north, just north of Union Street. Um, south Walnut, uh, 
there's two sections in there where we're gonna do a full dig and repair it. So when we come back and redo it maybe next year, the full depth is, we've taken out a lot of the problems this year. Johnny, uh, Johnny is, is part of that near uh, Millworks? No, sir. Okay. Yep. Uh, then we are doing microsurfacing on uh, Fairfield Pike. Green County's doing their section on both sides. So I jumped on board, so it's one continuous run. Microsurfacing is just a real thin layer, goes over top to help maintain and protect what's already there. Uh, we're also doing that on East Enon Road. They're doing both sides, so we jumped in and we're doing the middle as well. So East Enon will be all the way done. That will help prolong what we have there. So we're doing some preventative stuff. And then we are also asking them to uh, do some striping for us this year. Uh, that will be done on Corey Street, Fairfield, and East Enon. Okay. Thank you, John. All right. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments from council? Uh, questions or comments from citizens? All right. If not, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Last resolution is the one that we added a resolution 2019-16 and we can also do that by title only judy all right this is designating judy kintner as village council's designee to receive public records training on behalf of each of the elected officials pursuant to and in accordance with ohio revised code section 109.43 b and 149.43 e1 okay can i get a motion please i move second okay. All right. Um, well, Judy already explained what it is about, um, and I think the title says that as well. Uh, any questions or comments before we take a vote? All right. If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Legislation is complete. Um, okay. So next up, we've got special reports. And first of all, we're going to um, hear from Bob Wasserman uh, with an update on our police assessment uh, initiative. Nice Welcome, to be, Bob. It's nice to be here this evening. Welcome. Uh, there's no update because I'm just starting this afternoon. <laughs> but uh, we are underway. I just wanted to say a little bit about myself so you know. Uh, I've been in the policing area for 54 years. I'm a graduate of Antioch. I worked with and for Jim McKee when he was the chief. He became a very close friend of mine. After Antioch, I went to Michigan State on the master's program in its police administration, came back to the village. And while my wife, well, the woman who became my wife, Susan Hollister, who was a resident of the village, uh, I worked for uh, Howard Kao as his assistant. It's for a year, and I really got to know a lot of the dynamics of the government of the village, but uh, I have followed the village over the years. I've been here many times, and I understand the unique and very special nature that Yellow Springs is. The process I'll be going through is in three parts. It's part one is a review of its materials within the police department, a look at the policies and procedures, and uh, a series of systems. The second will be a wide spread series of interviews with a very broad, diverse group of people in the Yellow Springs, its community, to have a sense of how people view policing and what they think that its policing ought to be, as well as in-depth interviews with all of the officers on the police department and the chief and others involved in the criminal justice process, some of the committees in the town, et cetera. As a part of that process, we will host a town meeting that it, we will invite citizens to come and share their observations about what they think its policing ought to be and how the policing function ought to be reflected in Yellow Springs. It's very important that I get everybody engaged in making sure this is a broad group of its people who come in that it's not just one group who feels any way, we want a broad section of the community. And that's gonna take some outreach work, but that can be done. Uh, that will probably be held the uh, third week in May. And then following that, I will be developing 
a report of findings and recommendations and a sense of the policing strategy that makes the most sense for Yellow Springs and what we would suggest the best way forward is. I will be assisted in this work by Bob Stewart. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, he'll be here too probably, but uh, it's by, we're all Bobs. Yeah. <laughs> this is a big Bob organization. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's Bob Haas, the retired its police commissioner in Cambridge, Massachusetts, former secretary of its public safety in Massachusetts, uh, very, very well established and has done a lot, of, a lot of interventions in its communities this size with great success. And probably it's Bob Stewart will come, who is the former uh, executive director of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Officials, was a police officer in Washington, D.C., a chief in a number of its places, and uh, was quite successful as a, a senior management manager entering into these kind of situations. So the work began this afternoon. I had some discussions with people. I'm scheduling things over the next weeks. Many of you, all of you, will, I hope, sit down with me and talk about your perceptions. And uh, there are lots of others I'm gonna touch base with. And when, I, when we have reached a set of recommendations, we will prepare a draft report that we will submit and we suggest that that be made available for, for community comment and then we will finalize that and give a final report. That should happen in May. We thought we would start the beginning of April but because of contract and our obligations, it really started here today. It may go a little longer than the 15th of June, maybe a week or so, but that's kind of necessary to get all of these pieces in place. But uh, I think this is a very interesting and intriguing situation. I think we can be helpful. And the objective here is to come out with a strategy and a set of recommendations that the community will say, that makes sense. And this can make a difference in establishing cohesion of its purpose and involvement of the community in trusted relationships with the police and the police feeling this is good and a good way to go forward. Thank you. And Bob, I'm open for questions. Yeah, I, can you um, talk a little bit more about the, the part two and how um, you're thinking about getting that broad um, feedback from? Well, I've started out by asking the people I'm interviewing who else I ought to interview mm -hmm. and have discussions with. And I've kind of c categorized it into groups from my research. And I'm starting to get a very good list of those. And we'll be uh, setting up appointments to have interviews with them. I'm primarily doing one-on-one -on -one interviews. Mm -hmm. I want people to be able to talk about how they feel and what their perceptions are. I will be meeting with all of the officers on the police department a number of times. I'm going to ride with them when they're on duty sometimes. I mean, it's with all of them, but I'll also have discussions with them. So I'll really get a sense from all of that. Making sure that this is a broad-based set of interviews is very important to me. And that's really one of the things I'm doing this week, is organizing that. So then are we, are you reaching out to some of our organizations like the 365 Project and? Yes, I have, uh, matter of fact, I will be touching base with almost all of those. Okay. Those may be a group meeting, Okay. we'll see. Um, There's been some really good work that's been done in this community. Oh, yeah. And we have to be sure to take advantage of that. Great. This is not reinvention of the entire wheel. Mm -hmm. It just may have a flat tire, but we can get it all pumped, pumped up. up. <laughs> uh, other questions? Yeah, I guess I just had a question uh, with respect to the public forum. Just wonder if you have a, a clear idea of what the format of that uh, you know, might look like. We. Uh, I don't think we're yet at uh, forum exhaustion, although we did just have one last week. So I think if we just do one every other week, we'll probably <laughs> be good. <laughs> yeah, just switch topics. So, but if you have a, uh, an idea of how that would work, what, what the format, is it too soon to discuss what the format of that, what the interchange would be like uh, um, during that forum, the public forum? I have to be honest with you and say I do not. Okay. I am meeting with some people that's tomorrow who are 
skilled in that area and mm -hmm. have done things in the village before. Mm -hmm. I want to get their sense. Right. I want to lay out a series of options. I want it to be something that gives people who come a chance to work on these questions and also have a chance of a whole group process. Okay. So it, I just don't want it to be something that it's people come and sit there and kind of hear a few things and all that. I want them engaged in thinking about these issues mm -hmm. and being able to see if they in smaller groups can come to some suggestions right. and what they want their vision to be. Okay, good. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Um, other questions from council? Uh, any questions from the community? All right, well, thank you, Bob. I um, just want to say that yeah. this is my brother oh, who lives in Yellow Springs now. Oh. <laughs> so it's rather nice to be able to see him. There you go. <laughs> well, okay. I, I would like to thank you, Bob, for being willing to come here. Um, you know, I made this co basically cold call to you and thinking I'd get an answering machine. You answered. Um, so I think we are so fortunate to be able to have you here. And I think, as we said last year, Lisa and I had requested that money be put in the budget so that we could do this sort of thing. And uh, we're very excited that you agreed and think it's a, a great fit. And so I glad to have you I agree because it's Yellow Springs. <laughs> and Yellow Springs is a very special place. And we have to make sure that that stays that way. Well, we appreciate okay. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, did you want to add anything else? Or? Um, uh, only to echo a tremendous amount of thanks and, and how um, I think that what really is a hallmark for me is the collaborative and participatory approach and looking for a win-win um, that's so important to us and that I think we've been struggling with and I do hope the community isn't at forum burnout you know because the community has been extremely um, active and involved in our village manager selection process um, but this is you know another extremely important thing so we'll try to notice it as soon as we can mm -hmm. but I, I do hope that the community is paying attention and watching this I know a lot of people care very deeply about um, policing in Yellow Springs, so I hope they, everybody does participate. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think I just want to end by saying um, I really appreciated, Bob, your comment about um, looking for cohesion um, because, you know, we've emphasized throughout this discussion that this is a great opportunity to really deliver on those guidelines for village policing and um, and as you said uh, you know how important it is to maintain the the village culture that we have in Yellow Springs and so um, uh, I'm really excited about this process I think the communication piece and and figuring out how we bring everyone together is is, is very important so thank you okay. thank you um, all right, uh, we are now at Citizen Concerns. This is the time yeah, on... Quarterly oh, I'm sorry, you're right, quarterly financials. I'm sorry about that. Yes. Yeah, can't miss that. We do not want to miss that part, <laughs> Colleen. Thank you. Okay, so our first quarterly report, you got all the... Um, you should have received all the detail for the expenditures up to date is where we, where we stand at the end of March. So I'm just going to recap my cover sheet so we can keep it nice and easy and then that way if there's any concerns or questions that I can't answer, um, obviously I can get back onto my computer and address those at um, a later time and get back with you. So at the end of March, um, let's start with our revenue. Revenue we received to date for the month of March, I'm sorry, is $1,373,037.81. That brings our total revenue for the first quarter at $5,614,923.23. For the expenditures for the month of March, $716,456.80 was spent for a total for the first quarter to date of $5,622,034.32. And just going back a little bit of it, the first month in January is when we do most of our transfers. So even though there are revenue and an expense, they balance out. 
but they're included in the totals. Uh, February's revenue was right on line. Um, March, we did get our first half of our property tax received. That's what jumped that revenue up in March. For the expenditures, again, January's transfers, most of the um, capital that started, Johnny and his team are working on that brought in February's expenses a little bit high, and we're back on track in March. So it's only about an $8,000 difference from what we've collected revenue to date and expenditures to date. So we are very well on track and in balance at this point. The statement of cash, we have um, actually for your bank balances, we have a little over $9 million in the bank. We have an ending cash balance of 5.5 million. 5.5 um, represents available cash, and it's already taken out the encumbrances, which are open purchase orders. And then the bank reconciliations are included in that. So this is our um, our new report, our new cover sheet, and I just wanted to get some feedback if you like it, if it's detailed enough. Uh, to give you a good view each month. You like? Yeah. Okay. Is there any questions I can entertain? Yeah, I have. From the uh, ex detailed expense report. Okay. Which I'm come trying to find. Uh, <clears throat> so I appreciated. You indicated that the target percentage for the first quarter would be spending 25 percent. Of course, I understand there are things that go out that um, come at a certain time in the year that might not make that 25%. I just had a couple questions, well, two questions, I guess. One was, as I was looking, I was tracking the legal expenses okay. that appear in, I saw it in page one, page four, and page seven. It seemed like they were well over the 25%. So I'm wondering if you have been tracking that, if there are concerns about yeah. that. And you're on page one um, under the legal service At the bottom of page one, the legal under counsel, okay. legal services, is at 50 percent, actually 51. You see it on page yes. one of ex Yes. Um, it, it is higher than the 25 percent. Um, sometimes there are outstanding purchase orders that go into that figure, but um, I'll go back and take a look at the detail to see where we are. I know we've had a lot of additional starting out. The, the other places are at the top of page four, legal services for the administration, uh, and page seven was, I think, it's at the bottom of page seven public safety. So I know at the beginning of the year we said we were going to be reining in our legal expenses and I think that we need to be doing that. So, sure. And let me address on page four mm -hmm. on the legal mm -hmm. and I, I want to kind of explain the report a little bit. The very top line on our budget says that we budgeted 62000 It's a little bit of a carryover unused from the year before got added to our actual budget for this year. When you go all the way across under year-to-date expense, we've only spent 12000 of it. Okay. And then if you look under the encumbrance, it yes. says 50000 That means we have an active open purchase order that we know we're going to spend for that, and we've already opened up for that service. We haven't spent it yet. And the 100% includes that. Just mean, yes, uh -huh. exactly. That's okay. why those percentages will um, increase in a lot. Well, I have to look at what's obligated. Yeah, to be spent. And if you remember, council did the legal services a little bit different this year than we have in the past, as opposed to each department getting legal services. We put the retainer legal services in the admin budget. Okay, so then the 1003, which is my admin budget, that's where the legal services retainer comes from. And then for special purpose or unusual legal fees, that went into the council mm. legal fees, which is one zero zero one. So there are two different there are two so, different 
animals. So, so under that, on the first page and under council legal services at the bottom, mm -hmm. that's all additional beyond the retainer. That's correct. And you've spent 20000 to date on that. And a lot of it has been the okay. police issue. So has been, pardon? The um, personnel issues. Personnel. Oh, issues. okay. The other question that I had was about the utility roundup. I saw it include I, I saw it included in expenses, but and it was on page 19. But it didn't. I'm, main, mainly, I want to know how much has come in and how much we've spent on it. And I had a really good report when we had our meeting. Let me yes, check my revenue here real did. quick. Our mm -hmm. 200. While she looks it up, I'll say that we certainly could use more participation <laughs> in the utility roundup program. We, and, <laughs> right. Thank you. we no matter what that, that number is. <laughs> At the end of March, we've received nine hundred and twenty dollars, and that's um, a very most of its donations and the people who have volunteered to round up. So it's been a good number. Um, on the other hand, we've had a lot of people taking advantage of that service and that availability, and we have spent uh, 2100 So starting the funding last year, we got a nice grant, and that funded the project. We have been putting in, averaging maybe $200 a month mm -hmm. on the roundup. So unless we get more donations, um, we just had that discussion. We will have to watch um, maybe not having enough to help everybody that mm -hmm. would need and that help. Our, our team has been meeting. Um, we have a Miller Fellow. We have a strategy. So maybe when we get to agenda planning, we can include a, an update of the utility roundup mm -hmm. to bring everybody up to speed to what we're, what we're doing, both strategically and tactically, to have that program succeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I and mean, maybe we could encourage groups like to uh, challenge each other. Yeah, you know, hundred percent that, of that's actually yeah part of mm -hmm. one strike. We we have some great ideas, but mm -hmm. uh, but we we, need, we owe you, you an update. <coughs> update. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I wanted um, to ask about our investments. Um, so uh, first of all, you know we made that you know some pretty large transfers out of the U.S. bank account um, to you know earn more. Mm -hmm. um, how are you feeling about the balance in the bank account, could we invest more in Star, Star Ohio or Star Plus? Well, I'm waiting to see <laughs> how much more um, repairs we're doing. Maybe a little. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not too much. We. You really put me on the spot. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could look at it at the next meeting. Okay. I think our, our basic general checking account has a little bit of wiggle room in it. And yes, moving it over to the investments would be good. Let me try to come up with a number, but right now it's it's at a really good, healthy in and out stage. Mm -hmm. Since we do spend so much at a given time, I just want to make sure I've got it available. And of course, we can transfer back out of right. Star Ohio within a 24-hour notice. So, um, let me get a number that we can okay. talk about and see I if we can move that. some more. And it's, my one comment then, kind of related to that, is. If we could, and, and maybe we can talk about this offline, um, think a little bit more about how to show the return. I mean, I, I, I see the page where it shows, you know, sort of the month to date, month to date, year to date, but maybe getting an idea of just sort of what we're looking at in terms of percentage return on those investments, you know, month on month, just to kind of start tracking. How Star Ohio, Star Plus, and then some of the Huntington stuff um, is working. Okay. Okay. So, but we can talk more about okay. that. Okay, that'll be great. All right. And, right. and while we're putting you on the spot, can I put you on the spot for sure. something else too? I'm fretting about the revolving loan fund. And uh, so, at the last meeting, we had a, a discussion about the revolving loan fund and wanting to proceed with that. Um, there's money set aside. The source of that money is grants not taxpayer dollars, um, and we wanted to move forward with that with the Yellow Springs Credit Union. Um, I understand that there was uh, um, some preliminary opinion um, from an auditor, but not the main auditor, maybe, 
that they would prefer that we not work with a credit union because of the way credit unions audit. Um, the uh, structure of the money that we want to put into the revolving loan fund is not an account that will have a lot of transactions and credits and debits. Instead, it's a single certificate of deposit that just sits there and doesn't go anywhere. So I'm, I'm wondering if you and or Patty have had any more discussions about this and how we can collaborate and cooperate with our auditors so that we can move forward with the revolving loan fund. Yeah, Colleen and I did have a bit of a conversation with it and she was going to go back to the auditors and explain to them in a little bit more detail and see exactly what the, the objection was. Mm -hmm. And he so I understand the answer was not no. It was a we prefer. They prefer us not to use the credit union. Mm -hmm. um, it was my answer from both of them. Right. Um, I'm trying to get something in writing, and mm -hmm. I have not received that yet. So my, my encouragement is to see if we can try to get beyond prefer preferences mm -hmm. and find a way to get to yes. Um, unless it's illegal or from a regulatory perspective, no. If it's just a preference, I'd like to try to explore it because conventional banks do not really want to do revolving loan funds and the DCIC will tie our hands. Mm -hmm. um, as we recall, in a DCIC, the only time you can grant a revolving loan fund is if people have exhausted all other opportunities. So it really is in the benefit of our community and our citizens to have this revolving loan fund happen. So please, tr can we try? Absolutely, and I'm, I'm looking for that answer in writing. Awesome. I, I, I'm still waiting on it. We played a little phone tag. Okay. I'll put a message back in with your forwarding since I'll be out. Yeah, what, what I had asked Colleen to find out was very specific, uh, something, and I don't remember the exact wording, but it was like, is there something that prevents us from being allowed to do this? Other than their preferences. Right, yeah, that, there was some very specific wording that I had asked Colleen to send on, right. but um, as she noted, she is gonna be out of the office for a bit, so if you could just maybe shoot off an email tonight and say, hey, if you could get back to Patty. I maybe left him a voicemail earlier today, but I'll re-send um, that email and ask for him to respond to the email with you. So Thank you so much. And, I know I'm, I'm putting sorry, you on the and, spot. No, I'm, but, I would like the but, answer, I mean, too. I really want to have this happen for our community, and I would hate to have it stall out just out of Not preference. Not getting that, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a great incentive. And, and, you know, just I think you guys understand, right? I mean, it's one initial deposit right. that serves as a guarantee, and then the credit union handles all the you know, minor tra transactions, so it's not going to add more work on our end, so. Okay. And then, folks, we do need a motion to approve the first quarter financials for 2019 for that auditor. Okay. I move that we approve. Thank you. For not Second. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thanks, okay. Colleen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank and, you. And while we, just to back up to the Europe for just a minute, um, mm -hmm. one thing that Connor Jamison, who is our Miller Fellow, one thing that Connor and I have been going back and forth with is we need volunteers to canvas and go door to door and explain the Europe to the citizens so that um, they're aware of how it works and what they can do to help. And also, in some instances, what they need to do to be able to get assistance through the program. So the two dates that we're looking at for volunteers are Saturday, April 27th from 12.30 to 3, and then again Saturday, May the 11th from 10.30 to 2. So Connor will be blasting out some publicity. It'll be on our website, it'll be on our Facebook page, it'll be flyers around. If you can volunteer to go door to door that day, um, and help us explain the utility roundup to people and help them understand how to sign up or how to take advantage of the program if they are in need. Um, please mark those dates out on your calendar. That's Saturday, April 27th from 12.30 to 3. And again on Saturday, May the 11th from 10.30 to 2. Um, and we will get more information out about that in the very, very near future. 
perhaps some people might need some community service hours. Right. Uh, scouts, school or you students. Just, you just want to help. Yeah. Yeah, I know there was uh, some efforts to reach out uh, to the Boy Scouts um, to, to have them do this as a project. So I just want to sort of highlight one thing. Certainly, uh, in terms of the folks who want help from the program, we certainly want to make sure the folks are uh, familiar with that. But I think the really big push is for all of the folks who could uh, sign up to be a participant in terms of donating. Mm -hmm. On average, you're, we're effectively asking for $6 a year. On average, you know, you're rounding up your, uh, your monthly bill you know, from one penny up to 99 cents. So on average, it's not a lot of money. And so we're looking, we have a goal. I'm not going to share that because that's part of uh, Connor's um, news blast. But mm -hmm. we'd like to reach a certain percentage of uh, the population that is participating in contributing $6 a year. So Kevin, is the Human Relations Commission uh, thinking about it being an active part of this? Absolutely. Good. Seems like a good, uh, good fit <laughs> for the mission. Um, OK. All right, so uh, now is the time on the agenda when we ask for any citizen concerns. And um, these are topics that are not on our agenda. Um, so if you're here about the veteran update, um, Johnny's going to be talking about that in uh, just a few minutes. Do we have any citizen concerns? OK. Then let's move into old business. And uh, Denise, I think you're going to update us on the uh, comp plan first. Um, at the last meeting, um, there were some suggestions that uh, council had, um, which I did follow up on. Um, I did get some input from a couple council members. I went ahead and put underline those just so you could see, pull out some of the things that we added to the RFP. Um, and then uh, I talked with Green County Regional Planning. Um, he had some just very basic questions. His biggest concern with their update is making sure that our urban service boundary hasn't changed um, because they need to get that updated into the county, and ours has not. I'm sure there's lots of places in Greene County that where the urban service boundaries have changed, mm -hmm. um, but Yellow Springs is not one of those places. So um, he actually said he wanted to actually borrow some of the language yes. from this one just what, what you had said <laughs> would probably happen um so do you have any other questions as far as the some of the changes and i will notice we had uh, some issues on friday with um the computers and uh i, I did end up putting 1998 masters parks plan <laughs> there's a, some some uh edits that were made that didn't save. Um, so we've been working on that. Does anybody have any other questions? I think any, it looks good. I appreciate that outreach, um, you know, as we try to sync up with the county and also, you know, make sure that um, we've got a, a, a usable, uh, vibrant comp plan, so. Okay, well, if you're okay with it, then we will um, get it out there and uh, have Planning Commission then review the uh, submissions and bring you some recommendations. Great. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Denise. So Denise, we'll get together tomorrow and put the rest of the bid package together for it. Okay. All right, Johnny Burns. <clears throat> Well, I was about 20 minutes away from getting my quarterly report done until the wind hit. Mm -hmm. So I will be back next council for the update. We was literally in the process of putting it all together. I was standing out with uh, Judy in the lobby, and I was like, oh, that ain't good. She goes, what? And I said, the lights just failed. She goes, I didn't see nothing. Well, and then the next 15 hours, we were putting back electric. So uh, I agree with Patty. I want to give my guys uh, uh, kudos as well along with Dayton Power and Light, we're working with us on fixing a pole out that broke 
uh, on Moore Speen's property. They helped us out. Uh, it's their pole. We ride underneath them. Uh, they went ahead and did ours while we was doing some other stuff, and then we was able to get the uh, well lined back up and running so we didn't have to run on a generator all night. So uh, pretty significant damage on the south end of town. If you go from Morris Bean to Hyde Road Horse Park straight across the quarry, uh, you would think that a tornado went through that town. Mm -hmm. but, uh, National Weather Service says it was straight line winds. So uh, I know that there was one house that had a tree on it. It's got to probably have new rafters put on it now, a new garage, or a garage has got to be rebuilt because the tree went right through the middle of the garage. Mm -hmm. So, um, And I, I learned from that that um, it's not a good idea to plant white pine. Absolutely. Right. They'll snap off top of them, snaps off about 40 feet out of the ground, mm -hmm. and they do a lot of damage. Majority of the damage, if, you, if you're in that area, would be directly behind uh, Jen's house that uh, caught fire last year. I mean, it just obliviated that. So, uh, But we was able to isolate it, get town back up and running, and then work on that end of town uh, the rest of the day. So, uh, again, I, I'd like to say thanks to my guys, street crew, wastewater treatment plan. I just called everybody and said, let's go to the shop and let's get a game plan. So uh, they all worked very well. Um, I was contacted by Veteran, I'm going to say, less than a month ago. Uh, to give me the bearer of news that they're put replacing 4.1 miles of gas line in our community over the next nine months. Hopefully to start by April 15th, they actually started a week early. Uh, they are actually working on Fairfield, uh, kind of the same section they did last uh, fall, and they're just extending it all to Fairfield. The reason why they started on Fairfield is because, as you know, we just paved Corey Street and we paved a lot of streets and I said, hey, Fairfield's ready to be paved. They're coming through. We need you in and out before they come down there. So they have actually started on Fairfield, their direction of boring the lines in. And then once all the lines are in, they're energized, they'll come back through and start doing all the houses. They'll be removing about 430 gas meters from inside the properties to outside the property. So they won't have no more inside gas meters. Once they get done with the 4.1 miles of uh, mm -hmm. gas line in town. All the steel line will be replaced with the exception of uh, Cemetery Road. So I'm trying to get them to add this to where we don't have this. Then we'll be veteran free for many years to come. In the meantime, they showed me their maps. I've got four prints here uh, and they wanted to start downtown next month, first of May. <laughs> I said, it ain't happening. No. <laughs> I said, first thing we got to do is we got to talk to the downtown business owners. They got to have input on it. And we need to have a meeting with you, Miller Pipeline, and the downtown businesses and figure out what will least impact them because this is going to interfere with the parking. It's going to interfere with the foot traffic. And we need them to have a viable input to it. So tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, anybody's welcome to come. Vectron will be here, and I told them they better wear their hard hats because there's going to be a lot of angry business owners, which I fully understand. I mean, we did it with Streetscape. We, we worked hand in hand with them, and Vectron will be here to disrupt downtown once again. Uh, and I have addressed some concerns. Um, I'll just say this. We had a cruise last year that was not very friendly to some villagers, to some staff members. I had asked Vector not to have them come back. Uh, I addressed it with Miller Pipeline's uh, higher ups. They brought in totally different crews and they said that it's not acceptable and I fully respect that. I don't want anybody in the village to be talked to. I wouldn't talk to them that way. Nobody else wants to talk to them that way. So Vectorin is uh, giving me some numbers. They've put out flyers. They've done everything that they can do. Tomorrow would be the final piece to see where that project lands. I'm saying you ain't doing nothing until late fall at the earliest, and even if you got to leave and come back. Uh, but they will be doing two other projects after that. Uh, the first project is Fairfield North High 
from Fairfield to Pleasant, Pleasant Street from Walnut to the dead end, uh, North Stafford from Fairfield to Pleasant, North uh, Park Place from Fairfield to Pleasant, and Walnut Street, North Walnut from Fairfield to Pleasant. That's what they're working on right now. So all that's going to be uh, uh, <clears throat> you're factoring in the paving that you talked about because those all sound that's like all that's straight. all going to be the Fairfield will be the one that's getting microsurfaced. Mm -hmm. So they're actually working on Fairfield right now to where if Green County tells me that they're coming in next month to pave it, they can pave Fairfield and it won't be dug up no more. So are there places where they cannot directional bore? There is places they can't directional bore and right now. Be... Right now they're trying. Well, they're trying to do it everywhere until they hit rock and that's going to be their issue downtown they're going to hit rock mm -hmm. and so uh quarry street's going to be an issue uh limestone streets named limestone for a reason mm -hmm. uh, i found out that's the hard way mm -hmm. um, so where they're at now brian they've got pretty good soil they didn't have to dig nothing last year with the exception for the new house on high street but that was i think they did that because it was another company to come and did it mm -hmm. Um, then they have uh, Zinni Avenue. Uh, they'll be going from West Center College to Herman. They've got Marshall Street. They're going from <coughs> Zinni Avenue to Livermore. Then they got East Center College. They're going from Zinni to Livermore as well. And I have actually got them to try to get a hold of Home Inc. to make sure that there's no gas going in that new development that you guys are proposing because if so they have to re-engineer what they're doing right now mm -hmm. so um let's skip this one this is the bad one that's downtown <laughs> downtown so then we have let's see yeah these are two bad ones actually oh. uh the second the not so bad one is uh dayton street from king to winter, uh, so it's right outside downtown, but it's still on Dayton Street. Um, Elm Street, West Davis Street, West Limestone from Dayton to High Street, uh, High Street from Dayton Street all the way to Zinni Avenue. So South High will get 100% cast line all the way down. Uh, West North College from um, High Street, Northwest College, uh, west of High, and let's see, I didn't put the other one down. West North College. Oh, it's a little spur that runs off of Northwest College. It runs a little bit west of it. It's, it's very small. Uh, goes back towards uh, Tolly Street. Mm -hmm. um, now here's the one that will be talked about tomorrow. Uh, North Walnut Street to South Walnut Street, uh, that will include going from Pleasant to Short Street. Is that right? No. Hold on one second. Pleasant to Short Street. Yes. From Pleasant Street, which is on <coughs> at the North Walnut side, and going all the way to Short Street downtown. Street. So you'll cross north, and then you go into the south. Um, then you will have... Cliff Street will go from Walnut all the way around to Railroad Street to the houses right there on Railroad. Um, the backyard uh, between Walnut and Railroad, there's a back right away. There would be about five houses that's got to get a gas main. That would be the easy one. Then we got Corey Street from Dayton Street all the way to Gunn Street. Mm -hmm. There ain't nobody more upset than I am on that one because it's just got brand new blacktop because of the patch. Uh, so we are working. They've told me that they would try to work with me to try to get it off the roadway to be able to bore underneath of it. So uh, Glen Street from Corey to Zinni Avenue. Zinni Avenue from Corey Street almost to West Davis Street. Um, a little bit, uh, well, Elm Street, it would go from South Walnut to Dayton. And Dayton Street from the bend down here by the Bryant Center all the way past North Winter Street. 
So there's not a business in town that's not going to be affected by this one project. And, and they understand it. Um, I understand it, but they have to understand that the businesses downtown has got to be able to be open and do business. Nobody will be without gas for very long. They'll make sure that they do the new gas line. It's pressurized. It's ready to go. And then they'll come in and they'll do services to where they disconnect the service, move it outside, and it gets re-energized the same day. So until tomorrow, I do not know what the business owners are going to have to say for them, but it's an ongoing process. Vectoran's willing to work with us. Uh, so I encourage as many business owners or anybody in the affected areas, 9 a.m., rooms A and B at the Bryant Center. And they're open for any questions. So, you know, it's it just sounds good to get rid of steel piping and put in this fancy fiber. I mean, what what is fiberglass or whatever? They're, they're putting in poly polyethylene. Thing. Right. It's basically a PVC pipe. So, what are we what are we gaining? What are we avoiding? Well, I can tell you for fact. Um, they have a lot of holes and a lot of the steel pipe right now. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why they moved us to the top of the list. Okay. And so if you have many pinholes, that's the reason why you've seen them here the last couple, two or three years. You've never gone a week without seeing somebody from either Premier or Miller Pipeline or Vectoran in the area because we are a community that's failing real fast. Mm -hmm. So they put us to the top of the list. So when they re-energized that new section last time, uh it created a lot more less leaks which caused more blowouts in other areas and they was here for overnight they was here for a long time they started doing a bunch of surveying and they put us to the top of the list mm -hmm. so it will be an inconvenience there is no doubt in my mind it's going to be a uh pain in the rear job but it's something that needs to be done the village will be better for it yeah. Uh, and hopefully in a year's time we'll be moving ahead and we won't see them for a while. Do you have any sense, and, and I know we have questions, but do you have any sense for how much they can section it off? We have talked, they actually, you know, that's one of the things tomorrow because they're going to try to directional bore. Uh, there's actually two mains that go down Zenian Avenue, one on the uh, east side, one on the west side, and why they're doing one side, well, they got to reroute the traffic so that they can't have any parking on Zinni Avenue. Mm -hmm. So they'll have to have cones there, you'll have to create more lanes, they'll have to be flagging, but they want to be able to shoot down from like uh, limestone all the way down to quarry as one continuous bore, you know, that way that they can do it and they need to be able to walk that on top of that we have water lines and sewer lines down Zing Avenue as well. well the good news is if they can directional board actually be <laughs> they, way faster 100 percent they they way do faster. not want to open dig it costs them more money and, and it's more time right and then they and i expressed my concerns to multiple people at veteran again on saturday uh with another veteran member that we approached them two years ago or three years ago about jumping on board with streetscape and doing it then and they didn't want to do it then now what will happen is is they will try to bore to the business if not then you're going to have a saw cut to the buildings and, and once you cut concrete you'll never get it to look the same mm -hmm. so and then we they did have a patch on Zinni avenue uh that they did on an emergency uh, they are actually going to jackhammer it out. I turned it down. It's got two feet print in it. And I said, it didn't have feet print in it when you started. It's not going to have it when you get done. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, well, let's. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, we got some questions. Karen. Um, Johnny, is, is there a possibility that once they get to each structure, each building, whether it's a business or a house, that there's going to be additional work that homeowners or, or property owners are going to have to do that's unexpected? I do not know of any. So, that Johnny, you should probably be at the mic, and maybe okay. if you can just repeat, repeat the question. Them. Is there, after they get there, is there any work that needs to be done by the homeowner? 
I can say last year, I don't recall anything that the homeowners had to do. I do know that they hit a water line. Uh, it was on the customer's side and they called in a plumber to do it. And then what they did is they moved the rest of the bore line to the village side to where if we mismarked it, then we had to fix it. But uh, that was the, I only know of the one incident and it happened at two houses side by side, but they had a plumber come in and fix it that day. How open are they going to be to negotiating? I mean, you've got your feeling talking with them right now. They going I, to negotiate or they going to they, no, they've thrown out some ideals. They've thrown out. The question is, is how open are they going to be to negotiating the downtown section? Uh, they've asked me about working nights. Problem with that is, is you got apartments above some of those buildings, and we also have a noise ordinance that the council would have to allow them to work at night because even though it's directional boring, they may have to dig a, a, a hole up to be able to do that. I do think the veteran is willing to work with the community as a whole. Uh, they just need input from the businesses. Uh, I've encouraged a couple that I know that had some run-ins last year with some of the veteran crews that were parking in their areas and just leaving their vans sit there. I've encouraged them to bring that concern to uh, veteran tomorrow they are open for any kind of line of communication and then uh, they are they don't want to but they will if they need to come back say you guys don't want it done until November that then they're going to they're going to weigh out and listen to the business owners is there any option and I know we talked I've talked about this a couple people going with November, December, Should and I know we go, into, people who are listening? we go into the winter Please time. repeat the question. Uh -huh. Is there any way that they would even look at first quarter, Feb February, March, April, where the weather lease is breaking that they could do what they're, we're not as busy for businesses that we could, we could stomach that? So the question would be is versus November, or December, maybe waiting until January to April uh, for a better time for the businesses. Um, I would say that that's a question for them tomorrow. I would say that from what I've gathered, uh, they possibly could do that, but I also know that this is in their 2019 budget. Even though they've awarded the contract, they need to make sure that the work is being performed in 19 as much as possible. The other thing that we got to watch is, is restoration in the wintertime, because even though they do the blacktop and they can do concrete in the winter time uh, by adding chemical to make it set up faster. Blacktop's not available for the most part. They can actually get it out of Trenton, Ohio, but then it's a two hour drive to Yellow Springs. So then we're gonna have to do a cold patch. Then you come back into May and now we've disrupted again in the prime time of the season just to make patches on 68. Any other questions? I just want to thank Johnny for bringing them in tomorrow. I, we, I think you're going to have a lot of people there. Um, I did everything I could between emails and Facebook to let our members and the businesses know that this was happening. So I'm not going to say a lot tonight. I think you guys know how important this is. Wait and deal with, with Vectoring tomorrow. I, I would actually say that when I suggested talking, having Vectoring come in and talk to them, they said that they find out that when you have public forums, that maybe three or four people show up. And I said, <laughs> wait until tomorrow. And, and I even talked to him today. He said, well, how many things going to be there? I said, it'll be a packed house. Uh, we, I just want to let you guys know. I mean, I understand the down, downtown businesses. I have your back on my end. So if you're, if you make sure you come tomorrow and you express your concerns that I've already laid the groundwork for because I can tell them all day long how it's going to affect your business, but you guys are the ones that it affects. So. I, I'm not able to attend tomorrow because of travel. Do we have anyone from council at that meeting tomorrow? Can anyone go? Nine it seems here, really nine, important. 9 a.m. See what I can do. Good. All right. Thanks, Johnny. Thank Great. you, Johnny. All right. Dino? One more question for council. 
Do you want to come up to the mic this time? One more question for Council. I'm Dino Pallotta. Is there any, with Johnny was saying that possible night work, is there anything that, that would on your side entertain that at this point? I mean, not at this point, but would you entertain that? And waive an ordinance, the noise ordinance. That's not to put you at a spot, but just something to yeah. think about. If that's going to be mean, an Johnny option. and I have talked about this in depth, and um, <clears throat> whatever we can do, okay. um, we're going to listen to our business owners. We're going to listen to Johnny, and and we're going to push as hard as we can. I mean, you know, as Johnny's also expressed to me, there's a limit to how much negotiating power right. we have, but we're going to push as hard as we can. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, sorry. Okay, where are we? Um, okay, uh, Housing Advisory Board yeah. update. I submitted a written report that included housing and my commissions. What I'd like to talk to Council about is the first bullet regarding a Village Partnership with Home Inc. Because this is where I would like Council's input. So I have uh, contacted or, or done some research on looking for places that have agreements with uh, affordable housing organizations. I have not found a lot. I have asked Emily to do so, and she has talked to um, someone in uh, Wisconsin. But I think the most, uh, the best conversation that I have had, the best resource, resource is with John Davis in Burlington, Vermont. John is, um, John helped form the Community Land Trust in Burlington, which was, by the way, started by Bernie Sanders. <laughs> that land trust has now become a, a countywide land trust, and it's the biggest land trust in the country in terms of the number of housing units. So, and John has actually been to Yellow Springs uh, maybe a decade ago. So as I was talking to him about, you know, we want to have some kind of partnership, we want it to be as simple as possible, and I, he said, well, what do you want to do? And I talked to him about the glass farm as the main project that the village would be involved in, and that also we wanted to have affordable housing to be developed in developments that are not owned, and property that's not owned by the village. So that's a separate category. And then the third category uh, would be opportunities for, mostly it would be grant, grants and loans for repair and rehab projects. So John, as John and I were talking, he said, you know, it seems like those are three separate kind of things, and that Maybe the thing that would be the easiest and make most sense is to have separate agreements based on those things. So I'm going to start with the glass farm. That is clearly our opportunity to have the, at least the most say in not only all of the housing that goes there, but in particular the affordable housing. He suggested that we start with a simple memorandum of understanding that would say these are the things that we want to do with Home Inc. Can I, can I interrupt you and ask a question? Yeah. Um, how are we handling like conflict of interest and re refusal? He, given, given, I'm not sorry, you're signaling no. you out, but Kenneth is an, an employee of Home Inc. and I, I, I'm not sure how we're handling that given that we're directly discussing um, Home Inc. Um, at this time, I just as, an, as a new person, Kineta, sitting, yeah, exactly. being a part of this discussion. Yeah, it's just helpful for me to to understand that because I, as a new person on council, mm -hmm. kind of a new experience for me. I know in the past, if someone has a direct conflict of interest, which this clearly is, um, sometimes the person's left the podium. Yeah. Sometimes, so I'd like to clarify yeah. that. Okay. Well, I look for we, guidance from. Yeah, from I, our clerk I, and from our president, I just don't know. Chris, Chris Conard actually sent uh, an email, and I'm looking for that email. I can't seem to locate it this right at this moment. So, Brian, you're nodding your head, so I, I'm believing you were copied on it as well. Um, and 
if I remember the email correctly, what Chris said was that if we are speaking in generalities and that um, we, we're talking about um, uh, Home Inc. Uh, as someone who can give us information on how funding sources work or something like that, then Kineta can continue to be part of the conversation. If we're talking in very specifics about Home Inc. being involved in a particular project, then Kineta cannot be part of the conversation, essentially. What he suggested was that while, if I remember correctly, um, while he could not find anything that prohibited us for making an agreement with Home Inc. or um, that he felt it was better to say something along the lines of if, if a developer came in and wanted to partner with a nonprofit to develop anywhere in the village, that we could say we do have a local nonprofit who does that if you don't have someone you're already working with, essentially. Okay, you're bringing up two separate things. And first, and I was I'm, just trying I'm to, disturbed yeah. that Chris didn't send me this information since I had called and asked him for that. But at any rate, the two separate things are should Kineta be involved in this conversation? Right. Mm -hmm. The other is how we would work with Home Inc. So, I mean, I guess I would just suggest that Kineta, I guess, either sit in the audience for this part since then there's no problem. Yeah, that's fine with me. Well, I mean, yeah, in general, that, that's true, but, but based on what I heard Patty say, I mean, we're not at this point, or are we at this point, discussing home mix involvement with well, a particular why not? Home. Why not just be on air on the side of safety mm -hmm. and yeah. ask Kaneta to okay. either leave the room or whatever? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, you know, these conflict issues come down to perception, and mm -hmm. so I think that's, you know, so, so yes. do we want to ask her to leave the room or just sit in the audience? I think just sit in the audience is fine. I mean, that, fine. I'm, that's what I did, and I think I followed Karen's lead. I, I always left the room. I never sat in the room when I had a conflict of interest, when I recused myself. Well, because my, you recuse my, yourself. My memory is failing then. You recuse yourself so that there isn't any perception of <clears throat> influencing right, council members this. or community members who are sitting and may participate in conversation. Okay. I will recuse myself um, from this conversation. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and Marianne, I did find it, and you are copied. You are copied on this. When? Um, it was from Tuesday the 9th. And it's Brian, myself, and oh, you. Right. And I didn't yeah. see it. And I don't, sometimes, like, things get lost in my computer mm -hmm. or something. But, no, I did not see it. But I would like to continue now. Okay? Yeah. Sorry, I mean, no, no, I, mean, I appreciate I, that. But I, I think just it's important to bring it up. No, I no, hear I'm about it from community members, and yeah, no, no, okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. So, um, back to the glass farm development. What John Davis suggested was to have a simple memorandum of understanding as a starting point that would list exactly how we wanted to interact with Home Inc. So, for example, it could say we want Home Inc. some representatives to be on our housing advisory board and or whatever housing initiative mm -hmm. that we're involved. We would want ha ha Home Inc. to be involved in helping us think about how affordable housing would be developed in the glass farm development. We would want Home Inc. to be the affordable or one of the affordable housing partners in the development itself to ensure that we had one local representation and also that we had permanently affordable housing in the glass farm. So those are the, so in other words, the MOU would spell out exactly how we wanted to work with Home Inc. Mm -hmm. And la then lastly, it would said, and we intend to develop, to sign, to create and sign a development agreement when we get to the point where we know how we want to proceed with the development agreement. So that would be, that's talking about two documents, the memorandum of understanding for that project, 
leading then to a development agreement. I'll, I'll go through the other two things, but, but the glass farm is probably the thing that's rising to the top uh, at this point, I think. So the second bullet point, inclusionary zoning development. I, I had in the past used the term inclusionary zoning to mean mandatory inclusionary zoning. That is that uh, if the village were doing this, we would say for any development of five or more housing units, a certain percentage has to be affordable. You, you can say for any more than 10, you can say, or you can do whatever percentage, but that's what inclusionary zoning is. As I've been reading more about it, you can also have uh, incentive-based inclusionary zoning, which is really where we're recommending. We're not, it just does not seem probably that it would be workable to have mandatory inclusionary zoning. So that would mean any project that would be coming on board that's a private development, we would go to that developer early on and say, we, uh, we, have, these in we have various incentives that we can offer. We have to, I mean, we have to agree upon what those incentives are. We uh, have established that we would like to have 15% of the housing units in, in any of development of more than X number of units to be affordable. I'm saying 15% because Susan Stiles has been researching this and this was, the, this was the sort of sweet spot that she felt in her research. So in cases like that, then we would have a separate agreement with Home Inc. for whatever that development would be. I mean, this is what John Davis recommends. Maybe. So that would be a separate development agreement. In other words, a separate development agreement for every development. Mm -hmm. And then the last category, rehab and repair projects. Unfortunately, it's more difficult to get money for rehab and repair projects than it is for new build. Uh, but that's sort of how it is. It is possible to get some money. I believe that Home Inc. currently has a, a grant that they're working on. And usually th the money that's, that I'm aware of come for lower income people. Frequently they're for seniors. Um, frequently it's uh, energy, maybe energy upgrades or things like that. There are programs, I know Louisville, Kentucky has a program where they call it a repair affair and hmm. they get a group of volunteers, they set aside maybe a month in the summer, they have a contractor who's the lead contractor who works with volunteers, they get Lowe's and Home Depot and those kind of uh, businesses to donate materials and then they come in and Maybe they paint someone's house or repair a porch or blow, put in insulation. But at any rate, um, those are the things that I'm most familiar with. And in that case, John felt that it probably would make sense to have some arrangement with Home Inc. that said, you know, we, the village government has an interest in having our housing stock be uh, in good repair and that we support projects that Home Inc. is it for which a Home Inc. is able to get grants and that we would have some probably financial investment in that, whether it's just helping to get the grant or maybe some of the money from the affordable housing fund would go, go toward that. But at any rate, that would be a separate agreement. So these are actually four separate kinds of agreements that I've just listed, uh, starting with the MOU for the glass farm leading into a development agreement and then uh, the inclusionary zoning development agreements that would be with Home Inc. and the repairs. And presumably, <clears throat> I mean, these kind of agreements could apply to other, I mean, it's like, for example, in the second one, I mean, it mentions other developers as well, right? Um, I mean, these are options for Home Inc., but I mean, we could have these kinds of agreements with other. With other. 
affordable housing or, or i mean if somebody else was in the you know business of rehab and repair especially or like that, yeah right? for the rehab and repair okay mm -hmm. uh, that's an absolutely critical point for me that it's clear that this is not exclusive to home inc but i do understand the importance of any other local group that formed to develop affordable housing um, I, it really concerns me that it's all of this is just going straight to one organization if there there are others that form for example uh, we had public comment at the housing advisory board from a person who said well what if a group of developers in yellow springs banded together and we wanted to enter this space i know this space is difficult i know that it's very difficult and i know that home inc has a tremendous amount of expertise but we're trying to scale very broadly in yellow springs towards affordable housing and it's going to take the efforts of a lot of people so I agree that it makes sense that Home Inc. is involved, that we get their expertise. But I think that if we're locking out other local Yellow Springs developers who support the village values, and if we're locking out other developers and rehab people and construction people that are local, that are also trying to make money here, that we're really making a mistake. That I'd like to address this. Um, there's a reason why there's one affordable housing organization in Yellow Springs. Because it's very difficult. <laughs> Afford affordable housing is very difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is unusual for a community of this size to have affordable mm -hmm. housing organization. So, uh, and the only way Home Inc. is able to survive is because people donate money to it. it, it is, there's not a cash flow from the development. Affordable housing organizations are place-based organizations. Now, there might be a few like Habitat for Humanity that's a nationwide, but otherwise, they're place-based. So you don't have, for example, the Springfield Affordable Housing Organization coming in and working in Yellow Springs, or you don't have the Dayton, except St. Mary's is a big group. And if St. Mary's is going to come in, which it is, it comes in and partners with the local affordable housing organization. So it's, there's a, co affordable housing organizations work on a cooperative model, not on the competitive model. So you never have an affordable housing organization <laughs> trying to come into a community and take over that communities affordable housing needs the only way that happens is if they're partnering now if in the very unusual case that uh, some group of people could start another affordable housing organization in Yellow Spring that would be terrific and if they're willing to create permanently affordable housing mm -hmm. yeah. then more power to them so that what you said there is my point if it if another group formed another local group of contractors and wanted to also join this effort that would be terrific yeah and I, i'm not saying this to take away from home inc but just to say we're trying to accomplish a lot in the community and home inc is extremely ambitious and has a lot of projects going on so I think if other entities locally want to get into this, they, they, should, they should, and that what we develop here in writing should allow that. I guess that's all I'm saying. And, and I'll just I'll say that I'm going to fall somewhere in the middle, but that's not necessarily true. Um, you know, so I'm definitely on board with the whole, uh, the, the first set of uh, MOUs in terms of getting advice um, from, uh, from Home Inc. And then, if what if those MOUs lead to a development because I, I'm certainly okay with homey staying in the you know affordable housing lane you know I, I would use the word exclusive to say that all of glass farm wouldn't shouldn't be expected to just be affordable so these other any other developers would come in but they probably wouldn't be in the affordable housing lane there would be other developers 
And again, the use of exclusive would be just so that the entire property is not exclusively uh, expected to be uh, affordable or that Home Exit is expected to develop the entire property. That's where other developers would right. come in for different types of housing, market rate, et cetera. And actually how it frequently works, and we're having a meeting on the 30th to talk with some developers, but a for-profit developer like Miller Valentine, they've actually split off, so they now have a for-profit affordable housing developer. They, work, they come into the community and then they work with the local nonprofit developer. Now, if we have more than one local nonprofit housing developer and <laughs> in, the, in the, yeah, good well, luck. And I do just want to clarify, I did not read this as exclusivity. I read this as we do have an organization that does affordable housing that we have, you know, a relationship with and that these are ways to formalize that, like we've been talking about. So, um, so anyway, you know, I, I, and so the way I read it is that there could be other players. It might not be affordable, right? I, especially when I look at number two, right? And um, the whole like inclusionary development incentivizing piece. I mean, I could imagine in our housing development efforts, you know, we have an organization that would develop a piece of property and we think about this kind of agreement. So, but I do understand why the focus right now is on Home Inc. because that's what we've been discussing. How do we formalize that relationship? So. In particular, I think the third bullet about rehab and repair is worded that implies exclusivity. And I think that there might be other contractors or individuals in the community who could, who would, you know, want to get involved with that and manage it and be capable of managing it. Yeah, uh, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a sidebar, uh, there's a phase two of the utility roundup that we've been discussing that is very much like that rehab and repair piece, you know, getting at the more root cause of why people are paying more for utilities because their houses are leaking so much power. Right. And a lot of times those programs do happen you know, through grants. You know? Right. So if we have a viable entity that can get that money, I mean, I'd love to see that happen. Yeah. So I, I sent the, the email from Chris, since it went just to the three of us, I've sent it to Judy and asked her to distribute it to council. About so, the uh, conflict of interest? Yes, just so everyone can read it for themselves and understand. And if you have any questions, you can ask Chris and you can get the answers from Chris. And it will inform the, I think it will inform the discussion a little bit. So, um, I don't know if you, um, if you want to discuss this further tonight, if you want to put it on for the next meeting so that everyone can review the um, email. I don't know how you want to, I'm just putting out there that you will all be getting the email. I guess the thing that I wanted to be able to move forward with first was the memorandum of understanding with Home Inc. regarding the glass farm. Saying that, that moving forward with developing an MOU because you, yes. you, you outlined some of the things that would be in it, yeah. but it doesn't exist yet. So. Right. I wanted to see if people, if council wants to move forward with that. I am good with that. I mean, I, th I think we should continue the discussion. And so a way to, I think, get more specific is to see what that would look like. So. I mean, is, is that too vague? I mean, I, I will say I, I understand that we have, you know, a local affordable housing organization that knows the village, knows how to work with us. I want to continue to figure out how we formalize things. Um, yeah, I mean, so. I just have to say, and I clearly have some motion around this, that it is, I am incredulous that, you know, you, you go to Burlington, Vermont, you go to uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, you go to Sonoma County, California, that have community land trusts, 
And they're not saying, well, we should invite someone else in. I mean, it is like incredible that we actually have an affordable housing organization. If you had any understanding of what it takes to do to develop an affordable housing so, organization, but, the idea that we have to keep. So let me not. Yeah, let me speak to that because yeah. to say, um, I, it's. I think it feels kind of demeaning to say, you know, it's. Uh, it's incredible that that you don't understand it. So. Um, I do understand, but at a certain point, I've been on this council long enough to know that there's people in the community that want to hear more about this. And so by bringing these issues forward and having a discussion about it from this podium, I think we help the community to understand our thinking. And I think part of my responsibility whether I, whatever I think personally is to bring that discourse out loud to the table. And so when that's done, to, to say, I don't know why anybody doesn't understand it is difficult because clearly people don't. And so, you know, I think it is a process of ongoing education, saying what you said about, you know, of course it's very difficult. I know it's unlikely that a new affordable housing entity would emerge. But wouldn't it, as you said, wouldn't it be great if they did? So I realize that you have a lot of emotion because you have you know, deep, deep roots in Home Inc. And again, I want to say, I'm not bringing this up in any way to be critical to Home Inc. or in fact, moving forward with a memo of, memorandum of understanding that outlines the way Home Inc. would participate. But I think the community wants to hear this dialogue about you know, how do we make space for anybody who wants to help us to support this value? And that's why I'm bringing it up, not to be like ignorant or frustrating. <laughs> well, then perhaps we should encourage people who would like to create an affordable housing organization or affordable housing initiative to start doing it. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I can't remember who it was when we had that housing advisory board. It was a, it was a male. But that stepped up and said, you know, what if we, I wish I could remember better. Listen, I can't remember. I've been thinking about it ever since then. It was a group of people. Anyway, and, sorry. and the other thing is, you know, so there's rental mm -hmm. housing and there's home ownership. If we're looking at home ownership, and, I, and I'm asking council to affirm the decision that was made a couple decades ago that if we're going to put if there's going to be subsidy going into housing, we want it to be permanently affordable. The, the, the options are that it's affordable for a time period, mm -hmm. 5, 10, 15 years. At the end of that time period, the person can take the house that they've gotten maybe $30,000 value in, don't, you know, in subsidy, and they can leave and take that 30 plus all the market has risen. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the reason why the people at the time, well, that's why Home Inc. was started as a community land trust. Mm -hmm. And council was involved in supporting that at that time 20 years ago. So, a really so that would mean if uh, there were another affordable housing organization that could do that, it would also have to be a community so land. That's a really, really important differentiation. I really appreciate it because it isn't just a matter of building and selling an affordable house. It's the sustainability yes, of affordability over yeah. time. And I think for anybody that's listening who thinks, wow, we have some builders here in town. They're doing clever things, maybe you, reuse of materials. Maybe we can build affordable housing. For them to try to go it alone, they wouldn't be providing that land trust element, so they might even want to partner with Home Inc. Well, yeah, community land trusts partner with other organizations all mm -hmm. the time. They don't necessarily build the house; they will partner with the mm -hmm. the for-profit organization. But the, and the reason why having it be permanently affordable, aside from the fact that public money has gone into it. And it doesn't seem fair to have someone just walk away with that public money. Is that we have limited land in Yellow Spring, mm -hmm. so if if we didn't have a permanently affordable stock of housing, that means it, we just have to keep building more and more affordable housing. Now, rental is a different situation. You could have if you 
if you can find uh, someone who can build rental housing and have it be uh, affordable, and I'm not using affordable in the sense of having subsidy go into it, but have it be affordable to people who want to rent, great, more power to them. And I mean, because rental is the hard nut to crack, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the discussion, Marianne. I realize I was pushing, but I think it's important to talk about it. Yeah. Are you still oh, waiting for yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I, I'm, I'm going on vacation tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be gone for two weeks. So. It's just, uh, it, it's just frustrating because there's something going on, and I've never gotten exactly what it is. I don't know if it's people just don't want affordable housing, or there's something they don't like about Home Inc., or whatever it is. But anyway, we'll move on. Oh, now we're on decorum. Okay. okay. I guess this is you as well. Decorum, yeah. So, I, the, <laughs> just what I, I don't like that like. word, decorum. So, so this is this this is something that came out of the clapping thing, uh, and the um, change to is it an ordinance that we. It's Change. our um, it's council rules council. and procedures. Yeah, yeah. Council. So at, at a couple council meetings ago, council agreed to say that we could have no clapping, no booing, and I think no signs or something like that. And after that, Lisa and I started talking, and we actually, it turned out, met with Patty Bates. And um, I'll just speak for myself right now, but I did feel that it was sort of a knee-jerk reaction that we made, and there was definitely pushback. At the same time, the, the resource that Judy found, which is located in California, I forget the name of the organization, but it's a really good resource for a local government, did, you know, that, that was the resource that suggested that uh, that be part of the code of conduct. As I've been thinking about it, and then our discussion that Lisa and Patty, one, we have what goes on at council meeting, uh, and then what we have in the community. And we talked about both of those situations. At council meeting, I think we all want it to be someplace where people feel safe, where people feel hurt, not only heard, but heard in a sense of, yeah, I hear what you say, and maybe I don't agree with you, but you know, I'm listening to you. I, I, your your opinion's important, and and a sense of empowerment that people feel they have uh, some power in the situation. And so I think the clapping thing, and I, I haven't actually heard booing, but that it is that coming from that sense of wanting to have a sense of power. My my sense in terms of what we agree to in terms of conversation at council meeting would be best to be re one revisit it and do it with citizens and come up with a uh, agreed upon uh, set of guidelines for communication and that we post them then and uh, have them posted here the larger discussion of how people communicate in in the community and especially on social media, but not just social media. I mean, there've been some rather nasty things appear in the Yellow Springs paper, some pretty nasty things that people have said in council meeting about uh, council people or staff people. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm, I think that we might try to involve some organizations in the community to talk about how, how, how do we, talk to each other as a community and how can we have people feel one that they feel safe two that they feel like their their opinions are actually being listened to and considered and three that they have a sense of empowerment um, and that 
that's sort of where I am with this. Lisa, do you have anything? Um, yeah, I, I obviously support the idea of um, pulling interested folks together to talk about this. In particular, I, I would hope that we could have a conversation with some of the people who, you know, were the most uh, concerned about um, the, you know, the no clapping perspective because all along, you know, what was in my head, which doesn't mean it's what in everybody, any, anybody else's head, was that it had nothing to do with silencing speech, just silencing literally clapping <laughs> and, you know, the noise and the recording and, and that thing. So I think I really underestimated the uh, sort of visceral reaction that people had is that was really silencing a democratic process. I think we don't have any, we are not trying to sil silence a democratic process. So it would be helpful to really understand and figure out if there are, um, you know, are there any guidelines that we follow for behavior or, or not? I mean, is it the feeling of the community that, you know, anything goes? I just, I'm, I'll be interested in exploring it. And I think it would be excellent to, you know, in, involvement mediation and HRC and, you know, others who want to get involved. It's worth asking the question. So I guess I'll, I'll say a few things. Um, so first of all, I, I understand that how it could be perceived as knee jerk, but honestly, I've thought about this since I've been on council. And obviously, our former council president, who uh, indicated at a meeting that um, this was uh, a proper move, I thought about it prior to that. Um, and really, I mean, ultimately, it was fleshing out what Robert's rules of order mean. And the reason why I suggested that we move forward with it was because um, I started to feel like as council president, I was being a little bit too lax and letting the clapping and not using the gavel and all that thing go on. And it was interfering with moving meetings forward. It was interfering, as Lisa pointed out, with people's ability to hear on TV. And so, I, I mean, to me, it's clarifying that this is a different kind of forum where cheering people on does not, I think, facilitate the kind of discussion we want to have. Um, I mean, honestly, I mean, in some ways, like anything goes, I mean, it, it certainly uh, is probably, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe it would uh, not bother a few people. I'm not really sure that the majority of our citizens um, had that visceral response um, about that. Um, but that all being said, what I do like about this is the bigger picture of how we communicate and you know when everybody talks about this as Yellow Springs and, and the kinds of ways that we are role models and take the lead, I think that's the more important thing. So, but I will again hold to the fact that nothing has ever been said or done or anything in our behavior that is shutting down public participation. Quite the opposite, all right? We let people speak much more than any other community does at our council meetings. We invite that and, you know, suggesting that it's inappropriate to, to clap in a meeting, a formal meeting, um, is what Robert's rules are all about. Um, but, you know, if ultimately we get the sense that the majority of our citizens um, feel that uh, anything should go, I'm not going to be opposed to that. But I got the sense from the majority of our citizens that, uh, that that wasn't appropriate for our meetings. And I did not think that it was lending itself to um, getting business done. And it certainly was not helping us to get more input um, from citizens. So um, so that's my overall. But, but I like most of what I read in this proposal because I think we've, we've talked for a long time <coughs> about how we should all be communicating better. And, um, you know, we should not allow um, very disgusting comments about people in our meetings. It's really disappointing to see it on social media. And personal attacks, I mean, they don't get us anywhere. So. 
Well, we have the police forum coming up and the police assessment and new village managers and I'm, I'm going on vacation. So, I mean, <laughs> for whatever that's worth. Maybe you should um, change your plan. <laughs> so I don't think anything, I'm not planning on moving this forward at all right now, but keep thinking about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we also need to kind of think about um, what, is, what is our main work. And so, you know, I, I think these kinds of things are important, but I do want to make sure that we don't forget about our 2019 goals around housing and um, improving police community, community relations and economic development and everything else. So um, I guess if I start to get a little frustrated sometimes, it's that we do have a lot of these kinds of discussions um, and we need to remember, uh, you know, what's at the core of what we should be doing. So I want to forget that. Okay. okay. Um, all right, so we've got a few new business items and then we'll wrap things up. Um, first of all is the Tecumseh Land Trust uh, request. Um, Marianne, do you yeah, want to? Um, it was for their harvest auction, is that what they call it? Oh, uh, yeah. For um, <clears throat> request as we have done in the past for um, $250. And I'm not finding that right now, but at any rate, I, oh, here it is. So I would propose that we just say yes, that we mm -hmm. will do that. Yeah, this is, um, I believe we've sponsored the harvest auction, gosh, at least for four years. Um, and it's certainly, as they explained in their proposal, it's in line with our village values. We do have a small budget to support these kinds of um, um, community benefits and uh, and it's definitely aligned with our goals. So uh, I will second what sounded like a motion. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, Lisa, you had a nomination for the Economic Sustainability Commission? I, I do. I would like to nominate Emily Seibel for another term as a member of Economic Sustainability Commission. Second, if needed. I second. Yep. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, and I have um, three nominations for um, the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, and uh, we actually uh, very recently, I think, had some attrition. Um, and so we actually have three spots. Um, and so uh, since there is not a council liaison um, for the Board of Zoning and Appeals, the way we've done this is myself and Denise Swinger have interviewed the folks and gone through that process in the past. And that's what we did in this case. Um, so the first nomination is actually Dino Pallotta. Um, and uh, I will just say Dino's uh, served in a lot of different capacities to support um, village work. And uh, in this case, I think his uh, background as a business owner, local business owner uh, makes him a good fit. Um, so uh, I would like to nominate Dino. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Yes. Process question. Yes. So Dino is, um, alternate on planning commission can he still can he serve in both places? so we checked that out with chris okay. connor right and, and i would not want to lose him <laughs> on planning commission wait, wait, right wait, do we need to modify the motion can, as long as it's <laughs> right, right. Under the condition. <laughs> yeah with the condition that um okay good all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed okay i just want to point out that makes actually four commissions for nino and because he's also on the Board of Tax Appeals and the, uh, oh, wow. the, the Utility Appeals, the, with those two boards that were combined. So I just want to point out that <laughs> Dino is dedicating himself to serving. Yes. Excellent, excellent. All right. 
Um, second is Anthony Salmonson. Um, Anthony Salmonson uh, it was on our citizen committee for the village manager hiring process. Very analytical engineering background. Um, works at Wright Pat. Um, again, I think he would be another good fit. So I'd like to nominate Anthony. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed? Third nomination is Scott Olsterholm. Scott Olsterholm uh, formally served on the HRC. Uh, he was on the citizen um, committee for the village manager search this time around. And also, he has a background in restoration. Um, he's done a lot with uh, stained glass windows in particular. Um, so he's got like a mind around um, development and, and property and the issues that are related to zoning. He's also very level-headed, so um, so I'd like to nominate Scott. Second. So, okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right. Uh, manager's report. Um, I'm just going to highlight just a couple of quick things. First of all, the um, spring <laughs> cleanup week is May 6th to the 10th. This is the week that you can put large items. Um, multiple large items out to the curb um, and have them picked up please put them out on your regular trash day so if your trash is normally picked up on Wednesday they need to be out at the curb Tuesday evening to be picked up Wednesday morning um, so also uh, as was mentioned earlier don't forget about the utility roundup and rounding your bill up to the next dollar or making a donation in addition to that um, and it is definitely grass and weed growing season. So please make sure that you um, keep your grass cut within the regula regulations of the village. If you have any questions about what those are, you can call the zoning office. Um, you need to keep your sidewalks clear as well. And the last thing I want to point out to council is um, the promised brief on the YS Pride support is in the packets. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to just review that and put it on for a future agenda item discussion, however you want to handle that. But that um, is uh, the information that I thought was relevant to the discussion. Yeah, I'd like to put that on our May 6th um, agenda. And, and, you know, I mentioned also having kind of a broader discussion about the events that we sponsor as a village. Um, you know, that includes street fair mm -hmm. and, and whatnot and just what we can and can't do. But also, you know, we've talked about revenue generation um, mm -hmm. and opportunities, and so I just want to think about that. Um. Is there any information, as, as far as specific to the YS Pride request, is there any information additional that you would like to see? And if so, you can send me that information and I'll get it added. If we're going to have a broader discussion, do you want the previous briefs that I did about the different... It's not really a discussion about that. I think okay. it's more about like village rentals. Okay. Um, and I we're just, gonna, and just so everyone knows, um, Patty, Johnny, <coughs> Sam, and I will be meeting at the end of this week. So I'll have more information yeah. based on that as well mm -hmm. um, to bring back. Okay. Anything else, Patty? Uh, that's it. Judy? Nope. Okay. Uh, Council, any highlights from commission reports? None for me. Okay. Uh, future agenda items. MOU draft. Is that coming? <clears throat> you want to move it up? You're, you're going to be out for a bit, so. Let's see. Well, our, our next meeting is the 6th. Yes. yes. Let's have a. Put it on. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then Good. the pride proposal goes <clears throat> on. Uh, you um, rep update. Yep, got it. Yeah. Health assessment update. Revolving loan fund update. Yep. Um, we'll be uh, making our decision about the next village manager. So do, should I go ahead and put on a contract resolution on that yes. meeting? Yes. Anything else? Okay. 
All right, if not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, thanks everyone. It's been real. Does mm -hmm. someone have the motion for you guys coming out of executive yeah, session? Yeah, it was Marianne and Kevin seconded. Mm -hmm. And we did it five minutes till. Um, while you were out, uh, Patty said that. <laughs>